Matthew 7, beginning in verse 21. says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father, who is in heaven, will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And in your name cast out demons, and in your name perform many miracles? And then verse 23 says, And then I will declare to them that I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. This morning I want to talk about Lord and Savior. Um, We hear that term quite often, and it's a great great term. Uh, But I believe that a lot of people nowadays who have allowed such uh, lawlessness in the church and uh, the the humanity doctrine that we uh, encounter as we go from place to place. And we we hear that uh, Jesus is all we need and he is love, but they don't really talk about what that is and they don't really go into any kind of obedience and and, uh, they don't really talk about how much obedience really matters. They say, well, we've been forgiven, and it's, it's almost like a, a license to sin, and we know that's not the case. We know that in John it says, those who keep my commandments are those who love me. We, we see that very clearly. So I've noticed that many people profess Jesus as their Savior and not necessarily live as Jesus as their Lord. They may profess that he is, but... In fact, in in this same chapter of Matthew, in verse 16 through 17, we see that you will know them by their fruits. Grapes are not gathered from thorns, uh, thorn bushes, nor figs from thistle. So every good tree bears good fruit, and every bad tree bears bad fruit. So it's very clear to see that you can judge by the fruit. You know, God is the judge of all, but we can, we are to judge matters, and we are to judge uh, the fruit that we see. So the the fruit that bears in my life is a judge of my character. Anybody looking on can look at how I live my life and judge if it's good or bad. And we're supposed to do that. We're supposed to look at one another and point out and be the mirror when we need to be and reflect and say, listen, we see this. We're concerned about this. It's it's something that, that is necessary because we don't always see the error of our ways you know it's not until somebody points it out very seldom do i ever just think man this thing i've been doing for three years is is wrong i'm going to change it usually takes some kind of confrontation or somebody saying that uh that they see this in my life you can look at uh the prophet uh nathan had to go to uh david you know david was in sin you know, he was a, a man after God's own heart, and he was still in sin. You know, he had uh, murdered, and he had committed adultery, and uh, it took a prophet to go before David for David to see that he was in sin. And once he did, his heart was after God, and he turned from it. So in uh, 1 Timothy 1.15, I'll just read this. It says that it is a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, among whom I am foremost of all. Matthew 121 says that Mary will bear a son and he will be called and his name will be Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. So why do I feel like this is kind of an important subject to talk about? And it's because in the same way that we've heard the analogy Um, that a a drowning man cannot be rescued if he doesn't enter into the rescue vessel. We we cannot be, and, and, and people cannot be saved from their sins if they do not enter into the rescue vessel. So we, we, it's, it's not enough to just say a prayer and confess Jesus as your Savior, but you actually have to repent and repent and, and, and begin walking in covenant with the Lord. 
It's not enough to just call him Savior, but he must actually be the Lord of your life. If he is truly Lord in your life, then you will walk in covenant. We will walk in covenant and, and obedience to his word and his will. Again, in Matthew seven sixteen through 17, we see clearly that fruit displays the reality. It really does. You, you can plant a seed and not know what the seed is, but once it bears fruit, you will know what kind of tree you've sown. So the, the things we do in our lives, the things that we uh, count as important, you know, what we spend our time doing, all those things matter because we're constantly sowing seeds. We're constantly sowing good seed or bad seed, and we will constantly reap a harvest, good or bad. It's not that if we sow bad seed, we don't reap a harvest at all. We actually reap a bad harvest, and it affects us. And the devil throws these seed uh, in order to uh, entangle us and entrap us and to trip us up. One thing I noticed that in the New Testament, Savior is mentioned in 60 instances, and the term Lord in the whole Bible is, is mentioned over 7,200 times. So a little illustration of the difference between Lord and Savior. You know, I, Jennifer and I are, are married, and, uh, you know, she's a great cook. She, she takes time in preparing dinner. She, she enjoys researching and looking for new things to cook. I mean... And it's not just box dinners. She actually puts a lot of effort into it. And, uh, you know, it's, it's great. She, she's constantly researching and looking for new and delicious things for us to eat. And it's a, it's a blessing for me. But when we're in public, I don't introduce her as my chef. I don't say, this is Jennifer. She cooks for me. You know, it, it doesn't make any sense because she's, she's my wife. It does not display the fact that we are in covenant together. And in the same way, when people say that Jesus is my Savior, but don't live as, as, as if he is their Lord, it's no different than saying, no different than me saying that this is Jennifer, my chef, and not actually uh, proving the covenant we have. So Jesus is our Savior. He is. But he's also our Lord. Savior is what Jesus did. Lord is who Jesus is. In the same way Jennifer does cook, but she is my wife. And there's evidence that we are in covenant together and we are walking in covenant together and we are obedient to the contract that we signed when we said that we would uh, be joined as one. In the same way we are joined as one with the Lord. You know, he is our, our bridegroom and we are the, the bride. That same contract exists between us more so between us and, and Jesus. You know, he, he came to this earth, and I'll read some scriptures, but you, you, clearly we see that he came to save his creation. You know, we, we, had, we have soiled our garments, and he's come, he had come, to uh, make it possible for us to be clean and make it possible for us to be whole and healed and free from sin and bondage that, uh, that entangles us. Revelation 17. Verse 14, it says, These will wage war against the Lamb, and the Lamb will overcome them, because He is Lord of lords, and king of kings and those who are with him will be called chosen and faithful you know we constantly we constantly need to be asking ourselves you know is does does jesus reign as king and, and lord over every area of our life you know it, is it is it that we go so far and say not this one thing or are we actually open to to allow him into every part of our life. And, and that's who he's called us to be. You know, he did not, uh, it, it wouldn't be any, well, think of this. Well, what if I did marry Jennifer and there was 
uh, a portion of myself that I would never disclose to her because it would, uh, it would prove uh, maybe unfaithfulness or something. In the same way, when we try to hide, which is a funny thing to consider that we try to hide anything from the Lord, but when we try to hide or, or not acknowledge or, or try to keep the exposure of our sin or this certain guilty pleasure or whatever it is in our life, it's no different. It's not giving him all. And we need to give him all if we want to be freed, if we want to be whole, if we want to be uh, receptive and able to receive anything that he has for us. A couple of weeks ago, when Michael gave a sermonette, he read First Peter. And in chapter 13, or chapter 3, verse 15, it says, But sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense for everyone who asks you to, to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. You know, the first part of that, it says to sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts. You know, sanctify is a strong word. You know, sanctify is not, I think for, for so long I would hear the word sanctify and I, th and I would think that's a church term, you know. In the same way, and I'm talking like 10, 20 years ago, in the same way I would hear fellowship and think that's a church term. And so when I would come across sanctify, I would just read over it real fast or gloss over it, or it would never really penetrate in my mind uh, the meaning of sanctify. But sanctify means to set apart. And we, we sanctify many things for many different reasons. But our hearts are supposed to be sanctified, as it says in Peter, for Christ to be Lord. And so... I looked that word up, in fact, uh, and in the original, it, it uh, the, the Greek, it says that it is to, to purify initially by renewing of your soul, free from the guilt of sin, you know, and that, that's, that's not just part of it, that, that's everything. You know, we, we hear and we say and we talk about how we have to give all to the Lord and that's that's exactly right you know the the gift of christ is free but it'll cost us everything it'll cost us our lives and it should because the life we've lived prior to the lord and the life that we live in the flesh is worthless it's it's going into the ground and it's it's uh it's to die daily anyways you know anything i try to do of my own flesh is is filthy rags you know my own righteousness is filthy rags the only righteousness that accounts to anything is the righteousness that jesus has given me. You know, if we get a, a speeding ticket or, you know, we, we may we may get a ticket, we may go to court, we may go before a judge and the judge may be merciful and, and may save us from that penalty uh, of that transgression, but if we are not obedient to the speed laws, we will get another ticket. And you can guarantee that if he sees you in there again, there won't be mercy. You know, we, we were saved by the work that Jesus did on the cross, but we must walk in obedience to him as Lord of our life. And we will if we truly do seek him to be our Lord and Savior. You know, Amos 3.3 3, we hear often it says, can two walk together except they be agreed? You know, we have to constantly evaluate. We have to constantly, you know, we have cal uh, calibration records at work. And all that does is somebody takes the time once a month to take everybody's measuring instruments at work and make sure they're all calibrated to the same thing. You know, it, it's a, a two, three day process that we do every month. And it's only to make sure that all of our uh, uh, instruments are, are, are working properly as they should be and, and all to the same standard. In the same way, the Word of God 
we, we must constantly calibrate and constantly look to see if, if we are measuring and, and walking in our lives the, to the standard that he has set. We must be in, in, in agreement with his word and his will. And, and then the fruit of that is we will, we will walk in obedience. Hebrews 8. In Hebrews 8, verse 6, it says, but, but he has obtained a more excellent ministry by as much as he is also the mediator of a better covenant, which he has enacted on a better promise. You know, covenant is, is a contract. I've said that. You know, Jennifer and I have a marriage covenant. That's our contract. That... Uh, that is our agreement to, to be as one. You know, Jesus has made a better covenant for us, and it's our agreement with him that we are one. Verse 7 says, For it is a first, it, if the first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no occasion sought for a second. For finding fault with them, he says, Behold, days are coming, says the Lord, when he will effect a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Not like the covenant which I had made with their fathers, but on the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. For they did not continue in my covenant. They did not care for them, and I did not care for them, says the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their minds, and I will write them on their hearts, and I will be their God and they shall be my people. So you see why it's so important, like it says in Peter, to sanctify your heart for the Lord. Because if you allow anything in there to contaminate it, this covenant is a jeopardy. Verse 11 says, And they shall not teach everyone his fellow citizen and everyone his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all will know me. For the last, for the least to be the greatest from them, the least to the greatest of them. I will be merciful to their iniquities and I will remember their sins no more. You know, we must, uh, we must constantly look and see where we're at in our, in our walk with the Lord because it's too easy to not. It's too easy to get busy and allow um, Jesus, Jesus' place as Lord in our life to kind of shift or, or to kind of uh, get put on a back burner because we're busy with work, we're busy with family, we're busy with uh, all these other things. Uh, you know, our, our minds begin to get consumed with other things and it's, it's easy to lose focus on what's important. And we must keep the main thing the main thing and that's the Lord. So a few scriptures... Well, actually, you know what? I read, there's a devotional that I wanted to read real quick, and then I will close. But this was really interesting to me because it looks like well, I'll just read it. In Jeremiah 51 51, it says, Strangers are coming to the sanctuaries of the Lord's house. It says, In this account, the faces of the Lord's people were covered with shame, for it was a terrible thing that men should intrude into the holy place reserved for the priests alone. Everywhere, everywhere about us, we see, like, cause for sorrow. How many ungodly men are now educating with the view of entering into, into ministry. You know, what a, a crying sin is that solemn lie by which 
our whole population is nominally comprehended in the national church. How fearful it is that ordinances should be pressed upon the unconverted and that among more, the more enlightened churches of our land there should be such laxity and discipline. If the thousands who will read this portion shall all take this matter before the Lord this day, he will interfere and avert the, the evil which else will come upon his church. To adulterate the church is to pollute the well. It's to pour water on a fire and it's to sow a fertile field with stones. May we all have the grace to maintain in our own proper way the purity of the church as we assemble, as we begin, in, as we begin an assembly of believers and not a nation of unsaved and unsaved community of unconverted men. Our zeal must, however, begin at home. Let us examine ourselves as to the right to eat at the Lord's table. Let us see to it that, that we have on our wedding garment lest we ourselves be intruders in the Lord's sanctuary. Many are called, but few are chosen. The way is narrow and the gate is straight. Oh, for grace to come to Jesus aright with the faith of God's elect. We must be heart searching in our duty of all who are baptized or come to the Lord's table. The psalmist says, search me, O God, and know the ways, and try me and know my heart. You know, this is a devotional that, that I read often, and I happened to read it this morning. And then I had to go back at the author, because I thought, this sounds like something we would hear today. But this was Charles Spurgeon, and he was facing the same things we face, the same impurities, the same laxity in, in keeping the Lord Jesus Lord of our heart. And, and this, this is not a new thing that we encounter today where uh, people have, have ceased to sanctify their hearts. Peter wrote of it. Many church fathers have encountered it uh, time and time again. So I thought that was, uh, that was really interesting and timely because as we move closer and closer to the feast, we want to come before the Lord and be prepared to meet him. And, and we, want to, we want to remove anything. We, want to, we may not feel like we want to expose the things in our lives that need to be dealt with, but we should. Because the outcome is so precious. It's precious to the Lord, and it would be precious to us. You know, the, the pain of childbirth did not outweigh the joy of the child. You know, we, we, we experienced a lot of joy from Ruby, and we had a very hard labor. You know, it was multiple days, and it was, it was painful. We, uh, we encountered quite a bit, and we went through quite a bit. Uh, but we don't think on that. When Ruby wakes up, it's not like I'm thinking of the labor we experienced, and I didn't hardly experience it. My wife went through most of the pain, most of the pain. I had bruises. <laughs> after Ruby was born on my hands and arms. But it, uh, you know, it, it's intense. And, and that's how it is. In the same way, the refiner's fire melts down it with, with extreme heat, melts down the ore, and, and what rises to the top is the dross. And, and, and then the blacksmith can ladle out the dross, and then what, what you have when, when, when it cools is something that is closer to 100% purity, you know? So I pray that, that God will begin the, the refiner's fire in our lives and that we will sanctify our hearts and, and set him apart in our hearts as, as Lord and, and look for those impurities, you know? The, God will do it. If we're willing to, to go through the process, God will do it. And it's not comfortable. It's painful, but it's worth it. Uh, so let's be let's be mindful of those areas in our heart that may be hidden, and let's expose them. We don't have to expose them to the body, 
necessarily, but they need to be exposed to us in a way that we can get through them and then the Lord can deal with them. So praise the Lord. I just, I'm so thankful that he doesn't leave us the way we are. 